Uh, good evening and welcome to the first event in our fall 2021 season, which will include a reading by C.A. Conrad and Diane Seuss, introduced by Ariana Rains, a workshop featuring John Ashbery's very own typewriter, and oral histories of two pioneering Boston women poets, Anne Sexton and her rock band, Anne Sexton and Her Kind, featuring a dynamic conversation with her daughter, Linda Sexton, and the band's manager, Bob Clausen, plus a little DJing of some groovy Sextonian tunes, and a celebration of Boston-born Harlem Renaissance poet, Helene Johnson, with readings of her poems by Tracy K. Smith and Eileen Miles, and powerful first-person reminiscences of the poet's relationship with Zora Neale Hurston, Dorothy West, and Langston Hughes by her daughter, Abigail, who herself was friends with Ornette Coleman and Andy Warhol, to name a few. As with all of our events, uh, we will open up the interchange to you so that there is a space of a true um, and vital dialogue between us. This season is an exploration of different forms and instruments of freedom, and I couldn't think of a better way to inaugurate it than with our two readers tonight. In his remarkable series of essays, um, Will Alexander asks, how many beings do you know that truly qualify as living? And by living, he does not mean the circulatory force of blood, but a person or being who has at moments superseded the dialectic, or as he writes elsewhere, achieved totalized germination of liberty. Clarice Lispector in contemplating the same question reckons that her own freedom, quote, travels on invisible rails. And I would echo her in saying that I myself have not managed to be quite yet free, despite all my given liberties, have not been able to fend off the subliminal and psychic constraints that impinge on the page and neural paths of even this most free of art forms. But I know beyond doubt when I am in the presence of those who have, or who are in the continuous midst of doing so. Will Alexander and Nathaniel Mackey have in their own inimitable ways and patiently over the course of decades forged a poetics that venture towards what Henri Michaud has called the illimitation, such that to immerse in their work is to experience no end of ways against the forces that would endanger the passage of persons, that would endanger the passage of beings, they have created what Mackey rightly calls a release, a we, a way. The liberation they initiate and allow to migrate and catalyze in our minds isn't limited to a self alone, does not, as Moton says, consent to be single, but is distributive germinal, to quote Zola, and germinating. It is bread's turn to break us, as one poet has put it, and through their generous and generative ruptures of our prepositions, their vatic, multisyllabic weavings and interceptive beats, they revive in us the constituent particles of possibility, the nascent, boundless, and as Bob Kaufman put it, naked agents of every nothing. Here to break bread with them and us is fellow poet and friend, Fanny Howe, author of the recent collection, Manimal Woe. Tonight finds her in the very state where she first met Will and Nate, otherwise known as California. Please lift up your hands and welcome her and them. Thank you, Christina, for inviting them here tonight. It's, it's just so great. And I'm sorry I'm not in the flesh with all of you there, but you're not with any of me either. So um, both of them have an intense and faithful following because of the lights they cast. But here you are tonight to see them. That's the main thing. I'm speaking now to you from Santa Cruz, and this seems right since both of tonight's poets grew up in California, and the West Coast is where Nate Mackey taught for many years and where I first met Will Alexander. 
Will and I were part of a small group who loitered around Sun and Moon Books on Wilshire Boulevard in the 90s. Even then, his writing was bold, original, a plunge forward out of dark libraries into the sun. His words dazzle and are dazzling. Reading Will's work makes me think of the sci-fi writer Octavia Butler, who liked to be anonymous, hurrying to the library in LA and away from the radiant spears of palms. Words offer shelter from the sun, shelter for the imagination. Will wrote, I carry essential fascination with the scorching connective tissues between meaning and sound, as if I were that first genetic concentration, magically naming stones from primeval eras, unconcerned as I am with subsequent description of this act. He lays out all history as if it were a tapestry and considers how it could have gone otherwise. Will wrote for many years from this perspective, forming here a new vision. Recent books are called The Combustible Cycle and Towards the Primeval Lightning Field. He has given the first person, I, a new status, one that reminds me of the ancient Gnostic text, The Thunder, Perfect Mind. He demonstrates how the present constructions of speech narrative can't adequately adapt to new information. In his book of essays, he writes, if one could ponder fractals within a dark medicinal adage, one may come up with proof of a dense, invisible mansion. To me, Nathaniel Mackey builds and reads from such a mansion with his epic set of poems entitled Double Trio. It comes in a box from New Directions. I know I can't map the score this great volume follows until I actually hear the words read aloud. Dante walked the circles of hell with Virgil at his side. He used a vernacular never before used in poetry. Mackey has kept music as his companion and guide. Quatrains then three lines to cross as we let the rivers of his underworld people wash over us. We have to. These are our new American poets. They drown out the metallic voices coming from NASA. Will. Um, thank you. I'm going to start reading from an earlier New Directions volume uh, entitled The Sri Lankan Loxigro. And uh, this is a poem entitled The Bedouin Ark. Repetition as de-existence, as condoned and respun vapor, which continues to post-exist as mirages across an arc, as lucid underwater scent, an arc with its compression of oars, with its one simultaneous ascent over and above the simultaneous is movement. It's obliterated hulls where the body of the captain reappears and disappears, eruptive with schisms and salts, eruptive, eruptive with copias, blanquillos, and starfish. Extrinsic and solstitial to any forewarned destination, to any leprosy or rupture or fragment. An arc at the same time betrayed and withdrawn through an index of phantoms, like a squall beneath a stunning alabaster tide, inv invigorated by pre existing persons within its hull, spawned by a runic sea moon calendric, by fields of gnarled lava, predacious orange brown spider crabs feeding in diametrical coldness. The ark, now again visible to itself, amidst volcanic flamelets, fanning anonymous blades of crushing underwater jade. The wind around its hull, a void of pusillanimous optometry, a shell of scorched bottoms, a mechanics exponentially concussive, 
like a solitary benzene or an earthquake phylum or a riddle scorpion typhoon. Because this arc captained by scaleless ghosts, scripting their foundations from methanes, from a sound with a stinging pottery of nerves. Like murmurs from a hatchet well, scribbling maps, inducing subtractive protein on chemosynthetic shock waves of vertigo. So in the depths, a bioluminescence, a void, a glassy conduit of ore, a propulsive cilia, a whip-like chimera. The captain scripting these events in a geomantic log concerning the brackish flare from his burning central body. A body below creatrix waters, a body below the simulation of the trilobites. So that there constantly exists a smokeless anti-existence, which seemingly, seemingly enshrouds a multiple quantity or a glare. Much in the form of a stock nucleic food stock, like a summed explosive strife, which is the terra incognita, the fearful archaeology of fate. The arc, failing to illumine its former maritime amniotic by means of any purposeful or magic diarthosis, or any of the perplexing tonics of salinity, or by the Gorgonian as former body by persona, be it the pelvic whale or the caudal dolphin, the body of the captain, a blank indeterminate ether, a smoldering solstice phantom, a summer beyond the depth of a former viewing range. Superseding the diameter of Borai and the arc and the arc of the captain conflagrant as anti-causality, which post exists disintegration. The captain in possession of a colorless Bedouin's blood complex burning, igniting light by carbohydrates. Then just as quickly creating mass in a hydrozoic sea by means of insinuous noctilucca inside the fire of diaphanous algae. The captain is voice of the dinoflagellates as interior transpicuity. Now is translocated ember as photonic Bedouin artery with a sudden grasp of stunning neural ranges, electrokinetic and spectral with maturity. He who now thrives, thrives without name, floating throughout inverted lightning hills. Perhaps his darting appellation is hexagrammidae or goatfish burin, or form which takes form within Peruvian gurus. At the level, of a subdivided spheroid, yet no longer partaking of the desiquam or the kintel. In an unknown zone such as the German East Pacific or Dutch Borneo Peninsulas, like imaginary climates floating beneath a fragment of broken imaginal isles, drifting beyond the confines of nodes or pharmaceutical calculus gathering incandescent distance in a zone like Lake Urmia or in the powers of Coco Nord. No longer of the realm of geometrical Sirocco's of a prone and caustic emblematics, the world now fallen into a cryptic bay of moons, far beyond the connivance extracted from the Kama or the Paraguay rivers. Not a gnomic projection, nor a day's submission to funeric engulfments, the captain no longer of an ashram of vectors or typographic geyser in a void. He exists at nervous solitary limits. His former vibrations of liquidus, vulpine, indigenous to the moisture of flashes. The Bedouin arc, an exploded viral dove, a predacious anti-fixation, disappearing at the level of the leucosilinius, then the sea wasp, the sasal medusas, the hydrogen jellyfish, like obliterated bells, like the eye in depolarized coronas, seeing susuras, seeing fire in the 
form of entangled isolations in the arc of a neuron in the spark of a dark infinity. Oh, for this particular reading, I have, well, for all of the majority of my recent books, they've been all very, very um, protracted poems, long, long works, uh, you know, from the combustion cycle to the smaller pieces I have in the Loxodrome and in uh, volume coming due out from City Lights, by the way, in 2022. But A Refractive Africa is the book that is just, I just received a copy. Uh, it's coming out November 2nd from New Directions. And uh, what I'm going to do is, is, it's a suite of poems. First of all, the, the poet Amos Tutu all, I call him a poet because he's writing all these incredible tales that that that, that go elsewhere all the time and, 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 and very and very surprising flashes, verbal flashes. But the point being, he was attracted. I was attracted to him. And I guess he melded with the language that the magnetism that comes from the language and where you meet up in this this indeterminate ether, uh, the other side of non-living. And this, this particular piece is called uh, Based on the Bush of Ghosts. And uh, I'll, this is for Amos Tutuola. And I'll only read about ooh, a partial part of the poem because it's, it, it, it'll, it'll take quite some time. So 29 pages, so let me, let me start here. Having risen above dubious salt infernos, an absence of rules in your blood, never extended into doctrinal edicts. You, Tutuola, compatible with cosmic infra forces, with wheat that blazes, rife with its own combustible plane. You, all the while living, roam the anar anarchic as ozone, as region, as dark interior hollow of strife. You wandered through oneric vacuums, what some would call anarchic jubilation, seemingly blinded, seemingly spun by discomfort, by winds which sprung up and menaced, by forces which summoned themselves through attrition. Amos, you are not a corpse sculpted out of ash, but vehicular anonymity as voyage as its physiology summoned from unnameable tension. This remains your creed, your example, your, example, your ability to singe, to stumble as haze through incitement, to invade a sigil through raucous tipping points. These are forces you continue to breed being powerful towers of smoke, they being chronically unfiltered as the high symbology of the inscrutable, as if you had invoked exhaustive sands, squared at the root by corroborated cinder, by corruptive intensification. So that as births occur, they immediately exhaust all old bulletins of calcium. And all of them claim extrinsic home and hearth, being torrents reversed and unleashed as burning grams is a geometric sorcery that equate themselves with the charisma of slippage. And this charisma tutuola converges upon extremes as if a flare from perfect hydrogen had been squared and left askew, eschewing strictly numbered meridians. This being gnawing contradiction, a gale in the vines, being new and incongruous burning, being a suddenly crystallized contagion hovering as a bulletin of grimness, conjuring funeral, funereal ambrosia as if it had capsized in figments in hollow emotional regression as you charted the dead as a perfect stenographer of ruin. Yet you possess, possess that capacity to scramble yourself through forms, to reconnoiter dust, to ride upon this or that species of wool to con conjure taxonomic carrion that loosens, loosens its hyphens in a lake of ephemera. 
In you who fully flitted inside death, inside the innominate spiral, listening to a tornado of cowries, dazed, alive as alarming misnomer, as renewed and terrifying entrapment. You who lived as naked metakinetics, who understood as mode and concern exclusive forms of doppelganger. There are some who have lived who possessed no known form at the pointless juncture of physical dialectics. This being the realm where the great sun darkened, where mirages deepened and reinvented themselves by immaculate repetition that were no longer figments, no longer the brooding animations expressed by seasonal regalia. Perhaps you formed in yourself a curiously embraced agenda, being extraneous agenda, as new and increased forces of strength that spiraled as mazes, being other than palpable tempo. Other than chronic tenses that merge with conduction of stasis, no, this was fluid without marking, without bonds, sand, the blinding and corruption that was Lagos. Amos, you were free amongst the dead, roaming as you roamed, sending signals, empowering your own description via the omic. As animist, you knew that nothing could be quarantined, that nothing could be conveyed to the torrentially gangrenous, to the Western finance model. Yet you work from arcane occlusion, benighted by irregular ghosts, by a range of blizzards that coalesce beyond rays, and your ash, a deafening legendary blizzard, where human statutes were immobilized and scattered, where grains ignescently cooked in totemic pots of ice, where the sun reversed and sank and shone without shining. Tutuola, another optic, a tenuous inner navigation in your eyes beamed with inscrutable penetration, the cognizance procuring from post-mortem findings filigrees of hydrogen, therapeutic hydration, glossolalias of straw from which you mind preternatural stumbling from the danger of advanced mirages as in your seventh town of ghost with its debilitated chakras, with its power of snakes and vermin never to be conveyed to the worker emboldened by the trance of bureaucracy. Perspicacious as regards the inscrutable, you were always able to electrify in pragmatic noises, incognito habitations, always alive in the banditry of the bush, electric with ghosts within the oven of adventure who mark their exchanges through lullabies of wrath, through static arisen from curious dorsal waters. This was life through recursive transformation, through cognitive gaps in the record. You inscribed Amos, gales of unmined lightning bolts, underlying sulfurous transfused with gangrenous writing blood. A writing blood imbued with temperatures rare with interior oxygen, rare with oneric vexation. Let us say to, to all of that all invisible conflict remain tied to the bitterest tide of want, to the most unforeseen ether that remained entrapped inside the fever of glass that burned as garish entanglement. Perhaps I'm not attempting to isolate your pure and irregular fuel, natural volcanic salt rising as subliminal hives. I know you were not rife with blind and hidden fragments just to be exhumed and laid out on a table of scalars. And that peace was made with the province of cognition. No, I'm only concerned with submersion in the fabulous, in its Gregory moons, in its fulminant unbrokenness, being as it is, the invisible dossiers of Camel's enunciation, possessing telepathy as quickened ghostly neural fiber, 
as crucial turnings and light second mazes being some in infinite veering. You are not Tutuola, an anomaly from Abiyokulta, held up to the world as some lost or stunted student murmuring syllables from a hatch or from an erstwhile cubicle of spiders. All I know is that inscrutably burned in your ink like the son of a bad smelling ghost with an arm and no teeth in his mouth with a bare sparkling head as if polished. The above being organic conflagration burning as visible abrasion, burning as episodic pantheon, as kinematic entrapment. Is Yoruba poetic power? As you constructed your narrative around an interconnected series of autonomous episodes and fragments, Mariki praise chants, or the Jala Hunter's poems in praise of Ogun, yet as reductive working method. Even in death, you remain in the open range of danger with its tensions, with its unmonitored threatening. As in all the galaxies see with pre-eruption, neither living nor dead, neither lateral nor of the counterpart as motion. With all the suns floating throughout the indefinite, this is why silence threatens its own balance. This is why death retains its own electrical munificence that loops and then reverses itself, being elusive as to origin. Perhaps Aboriginal drift, alive beyond broken chains of measurement, beyond anti-designation where jaguars hiss, where broken constrictors hum. I'll leave it at that. It can go on and on. And by the way, this is the first time I've ever taken a look at the work since I wrote it. So it's one of the things I do. I, I, I write it at such a pace that I don't have time to think about what I do in terms of lording over the work is some kind of separate identity that I have to nurse. But once it's done, it's done and, and the energy moves on, the, the, the imagination moves on without it isn't, it's a slow moving sometimes, it's a very rapid churning of water and other times it's, it's smaller like a trickle or, or a smaller poem. But that is the river of the water of poetry, what I, what I consider to be the river of poetry, the, the motion of language itself. And for me, it, it washes away the, uh, it's like bathing, it, Bathing in the psychological Ganges, you know, where you, you get all the, the uh, residue off and begin to move with a fresh, open mind that continues to expand, like we, we see in the, the the general universal continuum, this continuous motion of, of expansion that can't be articulated in terms of a, a rational understanding. So to articulate and heal the water as language. I attempted this larger book some, some time ago, the combustion cycle, and it just began to weave itself across spaces of time, of time and space, and it began to just take on a life of its own and was naturally done in, in, in a very, a, a non a non strained feeling a feeling of of liberty which was, was always merging with within my uh, within my nervous system so this particular poem, book I'm sure it's been seen by several of the parties out there but it's it's a 500 600 page book and like who I just begin to glide across time and space. Maybe uh, something Nate can address too about the longer structures. And uh, he he has his his own magnificent scale that he's working at. But for me, it was just like a complete river of water. It's like you think about the Congo uh, River. It looks like an ocean just the, the casual view, viewer, but, but this, is, this is the kind of energy that I was working with. And so 
with this particular poem uh, book, and this poem is 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 going to be the um, first few pages of the um, the 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 second poem in the volume, and uh, the second poem in the volume is called "On Solar Physiology," and it's about a it's the voice of a Sangoma or uh, African healer who understands the ways of infinite motion, of crucial motion in, in all circumstances. And the poem is set during the, the great wars that, that, that just concluded in the earlier part of the century, 2004, where you had a, a maze of interest going on and going on and counter going on and counter counterproductive and the Cubans, the, the, the Angolans, the, the Portuguese, all, all the mixes were involved in this. And so he's rising above this, this, this continuum of cacophony at all moments. And so this is his understanding from the, the, the voice of the Sangoma. And I'll just read a few pages because it's, it's it, it, it runs over hundred pages, very far over that. So I'll, I'll start here. He says, I of the electrocuted hamlets of the transfigured remnant of elect inclement nostrums subsumed by swirling electron soils. I work by means of solar isolation, by means of combustive subsonic, by means of cryptic soma and bird. Trying to yield by figments a world beyond eras, a world with intermagnetic hydroxyl commingling with outer suns, with the electrical motion of distance through alterity. And it's because of this distance that I've claimed by the ambiguous, by dynamic hesitations, being both kinetic and counterkinetic, by a catharsis which rises through fervor and vacuum. Two, I've hovered within uncountable disorder, yet I've flown like a bird from stunning iguana transposures by blood type channeling through strange charisma and error i've never been able to reason from induction or hold my mind point by point according to mechanics accrued from traumatic incendiary counting my difference understanding the equator as absence of mass outside the realm of fecundity Because I sometimes waver in my gait, I'm accused of being flawed, of being a curious sub-celestial avian, unable to fly according to tenets which focus themselves through universal reason. Because I'm not of the conscious body, I'm focused by osmotic planes, by riddling anoas, by levels known in certain parts of the world as a sapien fable. By mingling in private, I've come to know certain aspects of being through transfuted fields, through roots and waves of vertigo, through imploded species of deer and the political subsets and the random holograms of speaking is where the sun onerically swims, where the galaxy intrinsically delights and suggests. This being the shaman's biographics the oneric glass in the genes, sometimes stumbling, stumbling in a shaken vitreous house, peering through a port hold of energies, as if the numbers were formed by an unbalanced wheat or an interior chart burning with a folio of diamonds. The rhetoric of the sun, associational gifts, empowering my soma as a charged Uranian warren. Not a war predictable as ideology or mist, but as resonance, as a relay of bells over vast projections beyond limit. And this limit being nothing other than the consciousness of limit, of thinking of itself within the predilection of that limit. Therefore, the phantoms they bring is limit and projected limit as being, therefore I exist as numerology, as circle, as a combined four suns being great astrology of rivers, 
And these river, suns and rivers by breathing, by gnomic scattering and burning, create by magnification, momentums of tension, fractals, apositional soils, summoned co summoning codes beyond cellular inculcation. Because I've only been judged by limit, by a culminant fragmentation, I remain obscure, pillaged by extrinsic determination, by untoward utility, practiced as imprisoning code mode, no longer of the overtone of the galaxy is living obscurity. I'm thinking of the common obscurity of eras as figment, the monological steam of the Permian, partaking of the fire before the earth was settled. Ironically, this becomes a curious fragmentary solace, a mode, a discipline, an energy. Being a singer in a hostile ozone field, I've come to terms with gregarious isolation, with tumult within various salt within the horizon. Because I'm out without definitives, without the dictums which sculpt the categorical, I seem de-energized, contracted, suspended as possibility, as enigma, as stray, as that which transmutes an abstract catharsis. So as molecule, as summed by conscious numbering, and placed in this or that projection as an a priori plaintiff a precarious ideology. I no longer bicker with my own barrenness, creating myself by judgmental folly, by a self-writhing plot bound by, sacrilegi by sacrilegious determination. True, my biology functions, I've given the craft of my breathing, and at times I monitor waves in my system. Not in the sense of counting a declamation, but as precipitous, precipitousness, as trance, a solar lake and its sigils. These being waves which flow from the summer, like a hatchling of novae or butane apparatus. I'm not the order of hives or buffeted within neurotic changeling hectares, which dissolve then through forces which dwell in external illusion because I am immersed in the counting of the upper and lower Egypt. I know the expansion of the Sumerian sun being active in entry through Mayan stellar portals, which means I am connected to the human solar center. And it's this solar center which articulates, which animates the Soma to the powers which dwell in the galactic central furnace, which issue as resonant psychic fields, as coruscating stamina, and each species being part of this stamina. For instance, the ants burning, revealing themselves in depths of psychic alps, being citric metamorphics, engaged in a rhetoric beyond the potential of human flair or quanta. All the levels reconveyed and drowned and reignited within the havoc of instance within three billion suns active as reverse rotation. This being the algebra of primeval protozoans within the flank of fiery brachiopods within the forms of odoriferous stellar algae. I speak through inverted agriography or the varying utility of particles, inscribing laments as scorching motility as a sand which crosses junctures, sired in the ethers as continuous heliopause. I'll give it a break at this point. One of the things I normally don't do is look, as I mentioned before, I don't really look at my work, I let it happen. So, it's interesting, this book was written some time ago, but I've never really picked it up, and looked at it. I like to have, be surprised by what it does when I read, when I finally do read it. So I'd like to, uh, you know, continue to work with 
unknown figurations. And I don't want to go too long, but I, I have just one smaller poem I'll read from the uh, Sri Lankan Loxodrome book. And that hopefully that will close out the in my part of the adventure. Uh, this one is entitled A Nexus of Phantoms. In a lower key cave, motions exist of disintegrated swans in a translocated lake brimming with harvested poisons sealed by corruptive postmortems. Such swans staggered by microbial reasoning, their aggressive nest anatomical with anomaly, with drifts of strenuous and carnadine meanings, with a thirst which hurdles conspiratorial invasives, alive with coronal oceanics, open like a clouded trail of rendings. Analogous with the ox, the pelicans, the mergantus, perhaps with the petrels and the gannets, under the power of darted mocking orations. The swans looking back on solemn blood perusal like a form of death breaking roses on the shore. It is, a tele it is the example of phonograms of lost and compacted lenses turning within charismatic fall line or an ISNF, or what an avian would announce in Greenland as a catabotic wind. The swans, like a haze of magnetism or implied gondola locations, where the scent of each lorikeet is consumed and brought to dazzling eclipse refulgence. In another foci, in another depth, their form self-challenged in a cloak of suns, their power de-revealed with seven moons burning reduced to two intense incendiary magnets. And these incendiary mag magnets like a nexus of phantoms scattered across a geometric optometry. And uh, conclude the, the informational energy that I've, I've conveyed leaves me in a certain way un I will say unwithered and, and, and full of other supersessional energies to go beyond, as Eric Dolphy said, it's going beyond what you've already done. And that's 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 for me very, very crucial to keep motion to going, to keep going, because language is motion, and the, the motion of language is is it's like water, it begins to cleanse the psyche as you move forward. And so the greatest gift I always for me is yet to always come, always yet to come. So I wanna thank you for my time and I'll uh, let uh, Mr. Mackey take it to another, to another space. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. And especially to hear you again. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I could just sit here and just move from side to side listening to you, you know, as I've been doing. But they tell me I'm supposed to read too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problems doing that. <laughs> How about that? That's How fantastic. About that? So I guess I will. Please do. Yes, I, I will. Anyway, very nice to be here. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, Fanny, good to see you again. It's been way too long. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Christina, you as well. I think, uh, when was it that Rachel Blaudipusi and I were up there at the Woodbury? Was that? It was pre-Trump. It yeah, it was a different time. 2015. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, let me carry on. Um, that's uh, Will and I have been friends since um, the late 70s. Um, it's a heavy baton he just passed off to me. Uh, <laughs> I hope I can hold it. <laughs> I'm going to read from um, Double Trio which has been mentioned. And I'm going to uh, get into the second volume, which is called 
Sow's Notice. Um, some of you know that I have been working these two intertwined serial poems, Song of the Andumbulu and Mu. And um, the uh, double trio is comprised entirely of um, that weave. Let me begin with Song of the Andumbulu 175 and a half, which has a subtitle, Stutter, Stay, Variora, Exit. We drove late into the night, went through many a toll gate. Dominican music was on at one point, and we talked about that. Mrs. Vex wanted to know what kind of time it was they kept. Close to native time, she said. Closer. The news went away while it played. Road wooing interruption where the goods, the gamble were. Mrs. Vex was the what sayer now. Carol was quibble, qualm. Canticle quest, question. Setting, surrounding set the scene. Not a sung story so much as a story surrounding song. The song itself collapsed into song. How did you do that? We asked her. Can't help it, she said. I hear things. No Ireland on the box, but there we were where the goods got stashed, got stolen. There we were, blown on by X-ray wind. Everywhere we looked, we saw bones underneath. The war between blue and gray again. The Afro was we'd be. We Fossa found our name was a kind of song or a set of songs. Epic we found as we read and researched it out. We were the song of the father's line. We the supposedly fatherless. Fa as in father. Sa as in sia. Lineage, race, we read. We were the song of not knowing our fathers. The abandoned boy and girls, epic lament. Accordingly blue, accordingly scuffed or abraded, accordingly gray. So it was, we rode our voiced acridity, railway thin. We drove late into the night, went through many a toll gate. Dominican music was on at one point, and we talked about that. Mrs. Vex wanted to know what kind of time it was they kept. Close to native time, she said closer. The news went away while it played. No Erlen on the box, but there we were. Where the goods got stashed, got stolen, there we were, blown on by x-ray wind. Everywhere we looked, we saw bones underneath. The war between blue and gray again. The Afro was we'd be. Road wooing interruption, where the goods the gamble were. Mrs. Vex was the what sayer now. Carol was quibble, qualm, canticle quest, question. Setting, surrounding set the scene. Not a sung story so much as a story surrounding song. The song itself collapsed into song. How did you do that? We asked her. Can't help it, she said. I see things, I hear things. Illinois was a fool to love the her he went on about. He let breath linger on the bell of the horn as we rode on. Holding her hips, he'd been holding the world, he reminisced. Bloom of what lay under, lift of it coming on. Regard, he and the horn would disinter. All this on the box as we rode on. Story of the story, not the story. 
the axiomatic we were moving on, migratory remnant, dizzy it made us feel the farther we went. Less epic song than long song, song its own sake. Thus we kept a rest at bay, orphan song. We found our name was a Mandy song, a certain something Mrs. Vex heard, saw the same as heard, eyes and all aspects of attendance on the box, soul said to ride inside a boat and to be a boat. In like sense, we were gourds and we were the stakes run through them. In like sense, we were soul's transit, trespass, soul breach boarding itself. Outside Utica, Perla Negra came on the box. Brass amenity so exactly what we'd been talking about, we wept. Blown away, we'd have said, had we been asked. Blown away, we'd have said we were. We climbed rocks, we were so glad to hear it. Happy, sad to hear it. Brass's exquisite obsequy. Blown away, not seeming so. It wasn't blue state, blue state, red state, gray, gray against blue, still unresolved. All states gray, when it came to us it was. The all but Afro was, we were. And let me read one more, a longer one um, from So's Notice. This is a song of the Andumbulu 185. It's dedicated to Will Alexander. Um, I was in LA a few years ago and, and um, Will and I got together at his house um, near MacArthur Park and we were talking and talking and talking. Uh, and at one point, um, this phrase came out from Will that I had to, get out I had to write down I think we were I've forgotten what we were talking about um, um, sub alternativity might be a way of, of of saying what it was but we'll just casually you know this this phrase comes out of uh, uh, out of his mouth the rigors of seeming defeat the rigors of seeming defeat and I wrote that sucker down and uh, it, it just wouldn't let, it, it, it worked on me uh, for a while. Then I decided I would work on it. And that working on it was Song of the Andumbulu 185. Sister C, it's so fit, it's so followed spoke on the rigors of seeming defeat, an idea she'd overheard one night in MacArthur Park. The blue bus was the ship that brought us here, she explained, the burnt bus, the flames no more than our not looking back. Tetsara stayed with us, hung heavy, so thick only a chainsaw could have cut it. So go the rigors of seeming defeat, Sister C went on. The seeming such rigors make it. Slave to whatever else bumped away with a hip. Slave to whatever else crumpled up with a grind. Sage encyclical, the moment let loose. Never to look back, no matter. Noses wide with the smell of burning wood, burning rope the sails of the ships on fire. We saw ourselves running away up the beach. Smoke, salt, fire's bite inside, salt itself on fire. Sister C, it's so fit, it's so followed, said all would be lost otherwise, and then said all would be lost anyway. We were speaking in tongues by this time, talking with her, talking back. Babel be our boon, we said, without words, or with words we made up, or both ways, 
choral insistence we cracked on Sister C with, seconded her with. Babel be our boon, we said, alongside everything she said. Such were the dictates of seeming defeat, fugitivity's rigor. Absica, absica, we said, a new word suddenly come to us. Absica, absica, a melodic scrap, more than meaning we offered up, meaning more than meaning. Absica, absica, we said, and we kept saying. The long work of letting go had a way with us. Grains in our heads that were hammers, Tet's migraine. We reached out suddenly, thumbless, lay down's day, run come. Such the rigors of seeming defeat again, the weight we put on seeming, Absica's melodic slap. Such were the rigors, made up words, made off with us, the we we'd otherwise not be. Sister C broke off her spiel to ask, Abacus? Absica, Absica, we answered, went on, and she went back to defeat's apparency. Rigor we groped our way through, rigor benounced only in MacArthur Park somehow, come upon the way she put it, by deep design. As was the rigor, said Sister C, so was the risk. It also figured, it also fit, a dream to make seeming dread unseen. I got it, Sister C said, from a man who drank from the paper bag. Salt's proffer, salt's phosphor, Absica Absica's well. Absica's wing had taken root, we no sooner heard this than saw. No way not wanting to know the way of it. Absica's acolytes even more. It was a momentary tear we went through. All sense accrued to Absica, silly as it seemed, sad as it seemed. Seeming so extreme, we sought cover in Absica, hollow whatever other words we knew. Sad it seemed, silly as it seemed, a rip we stepped in or stepped out of, slit the we we'd otherwise be. It wasn't we made it up or she made it up as we went along. Sister C had something to say. There was an alternate life shadowing this one, she said. Dark leaf, dark night, naked light bulb casting light. Refugee wood God carved on a whim, she said of this one. Love's comely ass included out of which we all know what comes. All the men blushed. Annuncio the elder blushed and railed out loud against time. Love's comely ass, my ass, he spat. Love's comely ass an affront to love, he spat again. Love's late decrepitude, he growled more than said, growled more than spat. Bodily breakdowns, no courtesy, no joke. Some of us laughed, liking his use of the word courtesy. Absica's hold had let go. Sister C hung steady, having something to say. She said, see it for the cartoon it is. She said, thus go the rigors, the brittle bones. She said, so exactly goes the long look into seeming. The scene, the scene had gone gray while she spoke. We were passing through who knew where. Our new fellow traveler, Tet, sat fidgeting. Her hot head made it hard to keep quiet. Her, her hard ass made her squirm in her seat. Nor did the rigors of seeming victory go unnoticed, she blurted out. Likewise, the rigors of seeming survival. These, the last words were spoken breath and water where we'd been a moment before, all of us gone like bubbles. 
a momentary glitch, which we thought on us before we do it and gone just as quick. Tet took our breath away. There was no other way to put it. Cover girl looks, love's legendary bottom. Ass, not glass, she pointed out to us. The rigors of see-through seemings rebuff. Riddle me, riddle me, Sister C said back. Cat hair climbing the stairs, the air had become. Backs up, we could see. We said it again. She said it again, rolling her eyes. Riddle me, riddle me. Riddle me, riddle me echoed and got louder, uh, louder as it echoed. The world, its echo chamber, it seemed. Sister C's read of see-through seeming was on the ascent again. Tet's migraine return, Tet's forfeit. Our new fellow traveler held her tongue. Beside a garden wall, we'd have been, had it been Sister C's to say, the rigor of seeming's demur, new growth, sunlit balm, embrace, breath would be in us always, were it her way, a bound beyond reach of extinction, ever abide. No way were we not behind her, no matter the scene had gone gray as she spoke, no matter Tet's ass, not glass, no matter the acknowledgement of ass had its claim, Tet's owning up to it a boon to seeming, seeming's precinct, love's platonic outlines twin. Annuncio the elder, even so, bemoaned his affliction. Locked out of the garden, carnal walls we stood beside, declines late rigor, seeming's retreat. He sputtered and spat and spewed Absica. He was a child in our collective arms, Absica's foundling, seeming's due re rigor, due regret. I'd want you to wonder what I ate to spit up so, he said clear as crystal, seeming day late amends. The moment's bones encased us, ribcage theater style, an egg in one's chest where one's heart was, Dogon collarbone spill. The rigors of seeming defeat, we kept remembering. Sister C's grade school class, changes rung on seeming defeat, an abrupt ladder, abruptly a way up, if there were a way up, abruptly such the way we saw seeming flail. I stood up and I sat back down, pounding the heels of my hands together. I wanted to say something about the rigors of seeming defeat. I wanted to say something about seemings, ruse and regret. I wanted to declaim and to become our entourage's golden tongue. I opened my mouth and could say nothing and I sat back down. I sat back down hitting the heels of my hands together. I said, Absica. Absica rode my tongue, told my tongue, tell my horse. Fleet bodily garden gone so soon, Annuncio wept. We too shed a tear, but it was history Sister C meant. We the seeming losers, we whose rigors were legion, what did we see, she pressed, when we saw through seeming? We were anxious not to mess up. Futurity, a word that wasn't, we were convinced. Absica, just but by now pat. Wary as well, no other would do. Absica, we answered, asking more than answering. Absica, Sister C said no. Tet, migraine or not, took no as an opening. Capsicum, she asked, outright guessed. Right away we were at large along Atlantic frontage, seeming's escapees, refugee wood, 
the divine cartoon Sister C said we were in, capsicum less than absica, absica less than copacetic. Sand kicked into our faces, burst into Queen's Anne Lake, Queen Anne's lace, Florets, Florets, beveling runaway heaven. No answer we'd come up with would suffice. So it was the point sank in, Sister C's lesson. Everything not all right would be all right. We ran on whose gambit, the rigors or the rigor of seeing it so, burnt salt, burnt sugar. The rigors of seeming defeat, the rigors of seeming such that nothing held, no matter everything cried out, stay. Everything no longer included us. We whose blues back in the day sold biscuits. A woman asking a man whose head she cut off, can you feel your toes? Everything called out, whoa. All of it always moving. We relegated to lag long since moving. We so relegated short of stay, short of status. We, seeming's defeat, let be. Let me uh, switch from that to um, a little bit of stuff in, well, well, two more shorter things in manuscript um, to get to the Moo series. Um, Moo 299th part. It's called the Subterranean Birds. Stories had migrated to where shards had once been. We too had been moving, telling stories that were not so much ours as the bottles that broke. A broken bottle wafting scotch, not perfume, cutty sark. Drunken elders reminisced and missed. Aunt Tootsie stood in a white dress at the very front. We were intuiting ends after life, it looked like. Ed and Fred had been teaching me how to cuss, and I cried, what the fuck? It had become clear what the question was. What the fuck was the question? We had all thought end died, but some now said he graduated from words to music, from prose to poetry, others claimed. Hassan ibn Ali had suddenly come back, harbinger of the lost Atlantis he'd been away so long. The birds had gone underground, but were ever with us, he promptly announced. Andrianette shivered and shook, afraid the birds would look up her dress. Aja followed suit and Sister C and Mrs. P followed suit. All the women shivered and shook, wary the birds would look at their biscuits and worse, fly up under their dresses and skirts. The subterranean birds would never do that, Hassan demurred. All Atlantean smile atop a trinkle tinkly right hand. The subterranean birds reaped and harvested by day, he went on. Their wings turned into mulch by night. I trod lightly now, no more what the fuck. We were each only a soul passing through. Ed and Fred had been teaching me how to cuss. Sheikh had been teaching me how to drink bourbon. It was Hassan's metaphysics tutorial I attended now, an auditor out of pocket. Wilson rolled over underground, having heard me say, what the fuck? He harvested bones inside his underground palace, a casino whose door was the tail of a peacock, a coda commuting the die it cast. Hassan took his pretend admonition to heart, as did I, daydreaming at noon. The subterranean birds were nothing or not there 
if not after my own heart, sip, sipping bourbon though I might, though I did. A sense of induction tugged at our sleeves and clung to us, a tone parallel to the word, a tone parallel to the world, we learned it was called, Hassan putting it the way Duke would. would. Wing flutter, rough, ruffling the ground. The subterranean birds were mainly a sound, but also more. Thus was it taught in the black mystery school. Thus was this the way we learned it. Thus was it there, this was the way. The subterranean birds were a sight to behold. They pecked away at the crust of the earth from underneath. Beaks broke the earth like the shell of an egg. Like they were hatching, Hassan lifted his elbows to say. What I wanted was to sit still and see Mount Kaf sitting upside down below the crust of the earth. No beaks breaking through, the birds burrowing down. I wanted the birds to lift Atlantis back up as if the earth they dug down through was water. Mu, while they were at it, I wanted brought back up too. All the lost isles and lost continents lifted up like picnic blankets. Blanket edge held in their beaks all around as if the earth they flew it up through was air. So went the project I hoped Hassan would supervise my black mystery school prospectus. It would say something about N's point of exhaustion, a resuscitative move as in ground gone under brought back up, mu as in Elmo, mu as in monk. Tone, be our elsewhere, our alibi, it would begin. Once again, we were where it was and and where it wasn't. The at we were seeking and the at we'd sooner lose. So it was, we said anyway. So the susurrant grasslands lay behind and amend us. Bird song below the ground, hushed but anabatic, chorusing the subterranean birds. We sipped our bourbon. We said, what the fuck? We knew it would go under someday, maybe soon. We'd one day be gone, the one certainty, maybe the one truth. We thought about worms the more we thought about it. We, the subject ones. We thought about bird beak and bird tongues torture being eaten alive the worms the birds would save us from, underground, the birds hunting ground. And a little tiny thing, a little bit lighter to end with, Song of the Andumbulu, 326 and a half. I saw my cousin Ellie sitting cross-legged above the pawpaw patch the sweet little Nelly of songs, Lotus Lift, a vision or a tableau that burst, a presumptuous bubble. I saw nothing after that and I was okay. It was okay. I was okay with seeing nothing. Way down yonder was where we lived. No time soon were we getting out even if at all we were getting out. Yonder was there, nowhere, everywhere at once, a direction only, all direction. I saw her float above the pawpaw patch and then I didn't. My cousin, Black Ellie, she and I of the kissing kind. Black Ellie sat cross-legged, 
there to jam and to chime in. Black Ellie sitting in from another life. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't get to all this. I said I didn't get a chance to get to all this, but uh, yeah. <laughs> invite me back. I'll, uh... <laughs> Thank you. Is that me? Is that me from last time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we kept our promise. Oh, you are very <laughs> sneaky. <You're> very sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everyone, please unmute your mics and thanks these gentlemen, please. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you all so much. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Thank you. Got his line. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Will. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Okay, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you to everyone for coming. It's great to hear you. Yeah.